Ethan. Hey, young Gamalio. Hoya, Tisto, Dwito, Anote. I said hello, my friends. My name is Red Eagle. I'm glad to be here with you today. I'll be speaking on tribal cultural resources. And um, yeah, I just wanted to introduce myself. Many of you are quite familiar with me by now. Um, I'm Four Quarters, uh, descendant of Four Nations, Quarter Nupik, Quarter Navajo, Quarter Sioux, Quarter Thona'atam, of which I am an enrolled member of. Quite a bit experience uh, working with tribes and um, newer to planning. And so that's kind of been my background, although my expertise is primarily with uh, cross-cultural or intercultural. Um, as Bob mentioned, this is part of an overall series. Many of you have been through the series together here, covering a vast variety of topics when it comes to tribes. This is kind of a, uh, a touch on the previous tribal resources and mitigations. Uh, that presentation really stressed the mitigations component. This one will stress more of the tribal resources as well as um, consultation and conflict management. A few disclaimers myself. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of all the tribes officially, and this is for educational purposes, not intended for legal advice. And uh, the information I'm sharing isn't for any political re reasons necessarily, um, and everything here is an oversimplification overview. Um, with the purpose, as I stressed before, a few variations from the previous presentations will be the purpose and outcome of tribal consultation when it comes to cultural resources and tribal cultural resources as well as a brief presentation, brief comparison between AB 52 and SB 18 and establishing a, a threshold of significance um, and best practices and conflict mitigation um, as a result of this effort. So what this presentation will cover is the consultation component when it comes to TCRs as well as determining what a TCR is and establishing a threshold of significance and then best practices in conflict management and then questions at the end. So we'll start off by consultation. I do a whole presentation on this, uh, but here are some of the highlights when it comes to consulting a tribe over tribal cultural resources. Hey, Ethan, so, are you meaning to share your screen? Yes, um, I thought I was sharing. Yes, you are. Sorry. I am. OK. So can you see? Yes, I think. Yes, it's good. OK. OK. So TCR reasons uh, supports tribal sovereignty. It protects um, the self-determination from the tribe and it recognizes tribal self-governance and it ensures the legal responsibilities as required by law. And the legal requirements are the bare minimum. And so uh, just understand that that's what's uh, required. So the overall process of consultation is the uh, flow of what that consultation means. And I kind of break it down into these different four components. And let's, I'll briefly unpack each of these. So first we have the initial meetings. This is what I would say is the pre-consultation process. This is where all the timing and location and format of the consultation itself is flushed out. So so much confusion is involved around consultation about what it means and what it looks like. And this pre-consultation part really flushes it all out and really puts forth what that consultation looks like. 
And whenever there's fees involved it's, or, or, or costs, it's important to flush that out as well as the timing, um, who's involved in this consultation process, whether it's formal or informal between staff or government to government. And once all that's flushed out, then it goes to the second or the, the consultation actually begins. The first part of the consultation is the review of the project information. So the, the project is presented to the tribe. This involves scope, maps, summary, the timeline of the, the construction and, and um, all of that information is presented to the tribe. This includes the um, any information vital to any ground disturbance and um, anything that could impact resources. Then the part two of the consultation is the impacts. So now that the tribe understands what the project entails, then the tribe shares what potential impacts the project may pose, whether that's sacred sites or historic properties, cultural resources, tribal cultural resources, anything that um, that could impact these very important things to the tribe of, of value. And then this leads to part three, which is mitigations. So once the the project information has been shared and the cultural resource impact is shared, then the discussion of, of what now, how do we move forward, developing mitigations. And so this part of the consultation, uh, hopefully both sides present and discuss mitigations and then agree on mitigations. So mitigations would include the standard cultural monitors or inadvertent discovery or or other cultural investigation reports, different things like that um, that are pretty standard. I, I elaborated on these uh, last presentation. So the overview is looks something like this. So the, the tribe is I kind of labeled as the dark green. And the agency and firm are what I labeled as the light green. And this process moving throughout, uh, we see the pre-concept. The agency really shares most of that information. The description is is mostly on the agency. The impact is is heavy on the tribe, and then the mitigation is shared by both. And then ultimately, it's the lead agency's responsibility to 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 make that determination. So it begins and ends with the lead agency. Um, and this is kind of the, the oversimplified process of the um, consultation when it comes to TCRs. So the outcome is that ideally both parties would agree on tribal cultural resources and the mitigations. Um, However, there is an out if a, either party acting in good faith or after reasonable effort concludes that mutual agreement cannot be reached. And it's important to document the uh, reasonable effort um, and the conclusion uh, of that effort. So it just goes to show that um, the consultation component in determining TCRs is so vital. Um, and with that, I, I want to cover uh, an overview of AB 52 versus SB 18. So we have these categories, AB 52 on this side and SB 18 on this side. And, and um, the agency is different, of course, um, because AB 52 is more of a project level uh, versus SB 18 is more of a policy level, so they're they're different in their intent and purpose and outcome. And AB 52 really stresses the California Native American tribes, um, as well as SB 18. 
and the it of course AB fifty two is CEQA, and SB eighteen applies to general plan or a specific plan. And the initiating party differs between the two. For AB fifteen AB fifty two, the tribes are initiating the party um, to consult. They reach out to the lead agency to be on the notification list, and then the agency reaches out to the, that notification list. However, that initiating party is different for SB 18. Uh, the, lead, the local agency is the lead initiating party. They reach out to the Native American Heritage Commission for the notification list and is provided that. And AB 52 is proactive as well as SB 18 um, as opposed to reactive. You initiate the, the consultation. Then the list um, is different. So the, the notification list I mentioned before is, is a list of tribes that want to be notified of that effort. For AB 52, that list is maintained by the local agency, by the lead agency. Um, and whereas SB 18, the list is maintained by the Native American Heritage Commission. However, the Native American Heritage Commission can provide a list for AB 52. And sometimes it's best practice to reach out to the Native American Heritage Commission in both cases. However, by law, it, it's broken up uh, this way. Then to initiate, um, the AB 52 must be initiated within 14 days of the project uh, being proposed. And SB 18 must be initiated upon decision of the general plan, um, update or adoption or, or specific plan. The response window is very different between the two. AB 52, uh, the response window is, is 30 days versus SB 18 is, is 90 days. And for the consultation itself, there is no time frame. Um, it's determined by agreeing or by agreeing to disagree. And as I mentioned earlier, and the noticing um, for AB 52, there's no special noticing requirements. However, for SB 18, there's that 45 day uh, noticing as well as that 10, the standard 10 days. Um, both of those, the tribe needs to be included in, in those. So wrapping up the, the differences between these two, again, the level is different. AB 52 is the project level. SB 18 is the planning area. The consultation type is uh, intended to be different. Uh, AB 52 is really um, consultation with the, uh, the experts in that field and is typically staff to staff. Some tribes like to elevate it to a government to government level. Um, and it really depends on the lead agency. Um, when it comes to that consultation effort. However, SB 18 is government to government. And the purpose again is the AB 52 revolves around the tribal cultural resources and SB 18 is that policy. And the outcome is um, mitigations as, and SB 18 is for alternatives. So now that there's that overview of consultation, um, how is TCRs determined? And that's determined through the consultation process really in this part two and part three component. Um, many of you are, are quite familiar with the CEQA statute and guidelines. I totally forgot to update this. Uh, there's a 2023 one, but in it, um, it, really stresses, you can see the definitions and the requirements for cultural resources. And primarily what I want to stress is the tribal cultural resources. Um, it really hones in on, on how the tribe is the expert and what is sacred and valuable to the California Native American tribe. 
And this is broken down into whether it's listed or eligible um, to the CRHR and or determined by the lead agency. And the lead agency determines this by considering the significant resource uh, value to the tribe itself. And that's why that consultation part is so important and why I stress that um, in the beginning of this presentation of how you consult with a tribe and, and what is important to the tribe in determining a TCR. Some additional definitions might include cultural places or cultural landscapes. Uh, ethnographic landscape are some other things that are being used more and more with TCRs. Um, so these are some definitions to be aware of. When it comes to the TCR threshold of significance, um, according to law, there are some things to be aware of um, when it comes to establishing a threshold. According to the, the code, it should be identifiable, quantitative, and qualitative, and uh, tied to a performance level of a particular environmental effect. And this is determined by experts um, in that uh, flushed out consultation effort and it is provided again up to the lead agency to, to make that determination by substantial evidence. So it's up to the lead agency to, to establish that threshold and the impact by the recommended experts by substantial evidence. And for TCRs, this is done through consultation with the tribe. And that consultation may happen through different components. Um, as I mentioned, the Native American Heritage Commission early on, and um, oftentimes the TIPO is the point of contact for TCRs, and sometimes the SHPO is involved or can get involved. Um, and for cultural resources, the cultural department may um, play a lead in that. Uh, sometimes tribes have cultural committees, um, and each tribe is structured a little different when it comes to the cultural department. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. Cultural monitors will play a, a role when it comes to mitigations or implementing the project construction. And when Sometimes you consult with a tribe the the Office of Self-Governance is involved in that component. Sometimes consultations are elevated to the tribal council or some kind of executive level. So that is also something to be aware of. In tribal cultural resources, um, you're interacting with the resources of the cultural components. And it's a bit different when it comes to tribes uh, because in the Western mindset, we kind of think archeological. So we kind of limit it to a, a physical component um, of a certain era, but that's not the case with, with tribes. With tribes, it, it's, it's very different. Um, and however, the, the experts of that also looks different. Here's an oversimplification of uh, tribal societal structure. Um, this is something that's commonly used, at least with the Navajo Nation. Uh, again, it varies with tribes. But we have a, a tribal society, which is the people. And it's, it's um, an overgeneralized uh, category would be like a cultural component, which the experts are, are the elders. Um, as well as cultural experts who specialize in those fields. And then there's a political component, which um, is the general council made up of tribal members and the tribal council, which is made up of elected officials. 
Um, I elaborate on all of this on the tribal government and sovereignty presentation, but this is a, a quick reminder. And then there's a spiritual component um, that the experts are the, the medicine men and women and the spiritual experts of, of that tribe. And so sometimes we, of the Western world over simplifies it and only discusses cultural. However, with a tribe, sometimes it's all tied in and there needs to be an understanding of how it ties in with, with different components. Because in Native American perspective, everything is, is connected. And so it's important to realize that connection and, and how and why it's connected as well. So in establishing a TCR, there are some questions that may be beneficial to, to ask in the consultation effort. Here are some questions that may help in, in the lead agency determining what a TCR is. Is it associated with any cultural or spiritual value or significance or importance? Um, oftentimes it's, it's good to, to tie it in with the cultural component. Um, and so this question really, really flushes it out and ties it in to that specific, um, is it associated with an event or, or ceremony? So, if it's of cultural significance and value, being tied to an event or ceremony is, is evidence of that and how frequently that occurs, or if it's tied to a certain um, significance in, in that event and ceremony. Is it associated with specific experts or uh, a history? This is a good question to ask if, if that resource is affiliated with, with that type of field or, or tied to a specific type of resource that is important to that culture. Um, is it associated with a master craft? This is also important to document um, because this is a criteria that's, some of these criteria are associated with historical resources as well, um, like, like a specific expert or history or, or master craft. Um, and so it's no different with uh, tribal cultural resources, only that the tribe gets to determine the significance. And so these questions help flush it out um, and the last one is this, is this associated with a tradition or a teaching that is being passed on? So um, that does it have a tradition in the past and is it, is it becoming, is it a tradition that's being passed on um, is a good thing to evaluate if it's in its significance and uh, impact. So. These questions help identify a tribal cultural resource and helps to identify the potential impact and helps identify the potential mitigation uh, when it comes to this area of the project. So some mitigation measures um, may include alternative mitigation measures uh, that the tribe requests during consultation um, and it includes avoiding um, or lessening potential significant impacts to that TCR. And it, it may be including um, recommendations from the tribe. And so that's why the consultation is so important in, in identifying the TCR and mitigating potential impacts to TCR. So uh, these are some good things to, to know and understand. And I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the um, importance of preserving in place, as well as protecting the resources 
um, that are identified of value to the tribe. And so these are um, important to, to continually be aware of and understand. So now we'll move towards the best practices and conflict management, and then we'll move on to questions and answers. I definitely want to keep enough time for questions and answers. So best practices. Um, when it comes to consultation, communication is so important. And um, I'm really going to stress the communication component later on or, or in a moment. But uh, early effort is definitely important um, in every phase of that consultation. Again, the pre-consultation component of, of communicating and agreeing upon what that consultation looks like is so important. Um, and same with identifying consultation or tribal cultural resources. It's so important to keep in mind definitions and and meanings and uh, being on the same page. Um, consistent contact people is so uh, good uh, when it comes to communication. Um, many of us face overturns in our agency or firm and tribes are, are may also face that situation. There are over um, overturn in tribal staff, uh, definitely on tribal council. Most council terms are three years. Uh, so understanding that the rotation of that. Um, it's good to have multiple contacts CC'd. Um, sometimes people are busy or over inundated. And I know I get really busy and over inundated at times and having other people included in those conversations um, can help move that forward. Most agencies have a tribal liaison or will be moving in the direction of establishing a tribal liaison. Um, so utilizing that resource is, is good um, and fostering a relationship with tribal staff. Meetings, some best practices is having multiple venues. Uh, oftentimes it's all located on one location when you can have it varied in different locations. Uh, alternating facilitators is also a good best practice, um, whether that be al alternating facilitators throughout the consultation meeting process or or maybe even in the meeting itself, uh, kind of the tag team uh, approach. Um, again, this is kind of best practice as coming together as as equals um, and stressing that that component of it. Uh, participation in developing meeting agendas. Uh, this is important when it comes to that consultation effort and consultation meetings. Open-ended flexible agenda is good to have and um, when it comes to meetings, having that flexibility is good. Some other best practices includes getting to know the decision makers of, of the tribe um, and supporting all levels of tribal government, whether that be departmental or um, otherwise. And understanding limitations on resources uh, for both governments, for, for your lead, for your agency and also for the tribe, um, understanding those limitations and, and how to move forward with those limitations. Uh, knowing the ordinances, general plans, goals, and policies uh, when it comes to cultural resources and tribal cultural resources is, is important. And uh, building agreements, whether that's a, a tribal consultation protocol or tribal consultation policy, just understanding that um, how to move forward together on the specific item. Because as I mentioned earlier, it looks different with SB18 than it does AB52. And it looks so different uh, 
with section 106 as well. And oftentimes we group it all together and think there's just one way to do all three when all three are done quite differently. So understanding um, the different approaches. Relationship is so important with tribes, uh, wherever your project or projects are and whatever tribe or tribes you're working with, that relationship is what binds the two together. Um, oftentimes lead agencies only reach out to tribes when the agency needs something. And it's important to maintain that relationship above and beyond that. Um, and it really stresses that cultural difference of, of why that relationship is so important. Um, speaking of the cross-cultural component, um, most disagreements happen on the communication level. And so how to resolve that communication or that conflict is boils down to where it breaks down. Um, so the cross-cultural communication, when you communicate in general and specifically communicate cross-culturally, there's what was meant. So there's what's going on inside the head. And then there's what's said, what, how, what's in my mind of what I mean and how I say it. Uh, I'm literally just making noises with my mouth and trying to communicate what is going on inside my head. And then those noises that I'm making with my mouth is being heard by you. And you're taking what is heard and you're, you're bringing those sounds to your mind and trying to understand what is being communicated. So there's what's given on this side and what's received. And so this is what happens in communication, uh, both directions. And so breakdown can happen at any one of these levels. And part of conflict management is analyzing where that conflict happens and addressing where that conflict takes place. Um, I used to call it conflict resolution, but um, it's really management. Um, these are some tools to help manage conflict and it's up to the lead agency and the tribe to resolve it themselves. Um, so here are some tools to help address the breakdown in communication and conflict. Um, and you can disagree without being in conflict. Um, I'll stress that more in a moment, but some questions that will help address the breakdown in communication um, at different levels. First, what was meant? Uh, the question of, of, you know, what, what, does that mean, or what do you mean by that? Uh, is a good question to help address the breakdown in this uh, area, or can you explain that further? Um, something that um, stressing and unpacking the, the meaning behind it. Uh, if there's a breakdown in what was meant, these questions help uh, address that. If there's a breakdown in what was said, some questions that could be asked is, is um, can you say that in a different way? Or, or uh, if you're expressing something, you can say, uh, for lack of better terms, this. So you're already saying, I don't have the right words for this. Uh, words are failing me. And this is the best that I can say at the moment. Um, and so kind of stressing the, the terminology, um, in in what was said. If there's a breakdown in what was heard, um, some questions that would be good to ask is, is what I hear you saying is, I'm kind of repeating it back to them, and then they are able to hear what was, what was said in a way that you heard it. Um, and 
this is a uh, I have a little bit of background in, in counseling, and this is a term that we call um, like a mirroring. So we're we're repeating back um, kind of an echo, and that when they hear what what was said, sometimes it 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 they understand it in a different way, and so um, it's like no, that's that's not what I meant, and then that communication is then um, reset and and explained further and it's good to stress uh, yes i'm listening but i i'm not sure i heard you correctly um, most times we affiliate heard with with listening and they're actually different um, listening is is kind of an active thing versus hearing is more of an understanding type thing um, and so really extinguishing those difference if there's a breakdown in what was heard um, understanding that component speaking of understood if there's a breakdown in understanding a uh, question that could be asked is can you help me understand better um, and am i understanding you correctly in that whatever repeating what was said um, so if a breakdown happens in in any of these um, communication components uh, we see that that there is a solution for these breakdowns um, and so it really stresses that most breakdowns happen in communication and so most solutions can be presented at the communication level. Uh, and then from the communication, you can discuss further how to move forward. Um, and if there's a disagreement on the project or the impact or the resource or the mitigation, um, communication helps move either of those forward and so we see that the cross-cultural communication is so important to identifying a potential um, dis disagreements and how to uh, move forward together. And so um, that's uh, important to understand and to implement and um, for specific projects and different things like that, it's good to sometimes hire out to or bring in a third party uh, to help move things forward um, and understanding that cultural difference and um, how to move forward from there. Uh, but with that, uh, that's my presentation and I'll move over to questions and answers. Uh, here's my email and phone number that can be used and I don't know if there are questions in the chat or if someone wants to audibly ask, but I'll hand it over to Bob um, to facilitate that and to, um, yeah, be available for, for questions. Well, great, Ethan, that was, that was very helpful. Um, the one question I did have, um, would be whether this presentation would be available as a PowerPoint or PDF, and I'm just going to recommend that they email you directly so you have some contact with them. So, um, yeah, please, if you have other questions and answers, you can put that in the question and answer section in the bottom of the screen. But maybe as people are typing up, or, or I think you can raise your hand and I might be able to notice you. Um, and then let you ask it yourself. But um, while we might wait, I might just ask a question. If a person is with a lead agency and the um, tribal relationship is not as good as it could be currently, and this person, you know, this person is new and isn't hasn't been involved with the tribe, is there, is there ways to work with a tribe and try to remedy that? Yes, um, it, there is no quick fix. It takes time and effort. Just like if there is a um, 
trying to think of the right words. Just like if there is damage to a relationship, you know, between you and your family or you and your friends, um, it takes time and effort to repair that relationship. And it's the same way with working with tribes. If there is a damaged relationship with a tribe, it takes time and effort to repair that relationship. And the lead agency has to determine its values and priorities when it comes to that and how much time and effort that lead agency wants to uh, invest in that relationship. Um, this goes above and beyond any kind of requirements or any quote unquote maybe job description, um, but the lead agency would have to determine, again, that that value and priority. Um, with time and effort, it may look different with each tribe. I know there was one tribe, our, uh, speaking from experience, one example is a tribe that had a really bad relationship with a certain entity and I tried to repair that relationship and it took nine months um, to repair that relationship. And it involved multiple uh, friendly meetings, uh, just dropping by with no set agenda, um, just a discussion. And then over time, the tribal representative brought up you know, certain um, grievances. And at each of those opportunities, those grievances were addressed um, and reassured the tribal representative of the concerns. And over that nine month period, that relationship was restored. Um, so it does take time and effort. And again, that looks different according to that relationship of that agency and that tribe and whatever grievance that may be. Um, but yes, it is possible um, and it can be done. Okay, I do have a question from Guido. I'm gonna allow him to talk. Guido, please. Hi, uh, this is actually Allison Hunter. Hi, everybody. <laughs> well, hi, Allison. Hi, and Guido, my boss. Um, I was just putting in the the same question in the um, question and answer, but here on the Central Coast, we work with uh, two non-federally recognized tribes, and they're very, very small and not well organized, and we are actually consulting on the city staff level with tribal chairs. So they don't have staff. Um, we are you know, we're doing basically local staff level with, you know, a sovereign nation, a sovereign person. Uh, do you have any advice on any different, um, you know, ways of communicating directly with the chair versus, I know up on the North Coast, you have, you know, you're working with these very large, well-organized, federally recognized tribes, and you have TIPOs, and it's more of a staff-to-staff -staff type of relationship, but just wondering about any tips for working directly with chairs. Thank you. Yes, great question. Um, sometimes, uh, I'll generalize that question. Sometimes tribes are understaffed and tribes get over notified um, and they're inundated with all these notifications and they aren't able to get to all of them, uh, irregardless of their situation. Um, and so the best way to move forward is to um, agree upon either a process or um to be on the same understanding of of effort um oftentimes well by law a lead agency can agree on a time frame with the tribe 
Uh, so the log provides a certain time, a standard time frame, and then it makes a provision for an agreed upon time frame between that agency and tribe. In other words, the the state is mostly interested on the lead agency and the tribe being on the same page, with the same understanding, um, and have that effort be done on that basis. Um, so having the, the discussion with the tribe on its values and its priorities, sometimes the tribe may be over notified and so reevaluating on on which projects that that notification that triggers that notification, whether it be a certain area or a certain type of project um, can be reevaluated and agreed upon. Um, and so it's it's really brings it back to that discussion between that lead agency and tribe um, to reevaluate that existing effort and maybe to tweak that um, effort. I think that's the best general answer that I could provide to that. Um, and then tribes grow and they they have they grow their staff and so it changes throughout time. Um, and so in your particular scenario, I think it'd be best to to have that discussion on what that looks like with with that chair um, and understanding that limitation. Similar question um, Tara asks is, we don't often get requests for consultation from AB 52 notifications. So we don't often have the opportunity to have meaningful conversations about the potential significance of a project. Do you have recommendations for encouraging the tribe to participate in consultation? So is this question coming from a, a lead agency perspective or from a tribal perspective? From a lead agency. Okay. So from the lead agency um, to encourage tribes to participate in the consultation, um, some best practices would be to uh, do a informational presentation to the tribe on that consultation process and effort and kind of stressing the um, the tribe's participation potential participation in that um, but it's really up to the tribe to determine if they want to consult or not. Best practice on the tribe side is to send a letter saying that there is no, that they decline consultation uh, because they have no concerns for TCRs um, for that particular project. But oftentimes tribes will not respond. Um, and it's good to encourage the tribe to at least provide that, um, that minimal response. Um, and again, having that discussion of maybe the tribe is being over notified and tweaking what they get notified on um, would be a good discussion to have. But um, it'd be up to the tribe to determine its values and its priorities. Um, and I, based on my experience, the tribe has no problem um, participating if there is a significant value or significant impact. Um, and it's it's some, it's good to hear a lead agency concerned of lack of part tribal participation. Um, and uh, one more thing on that is that by law, the tribe doesn't have to consult. Um, however, by law, the lead agency has to reach out. Um, so documenting all of that effort. Um, and if the tribe chooses not to participate, then that's the tribe's decision. Um, and so having all that documented is, is important. So if I hear you correctly, no, I'm just trying out my tools that you provided. 
Um, well, good. And, and I think I've heard you say before that tribal funding is limited. A lot of time it's grant funding. They don't necessarily have general funds. And so reaching out and making that extra effort and making sure people are not, you know, they have their own deadlines as well for their projects. Correct. So I had a question for you, Ethan. Um, in working on CEQA and NEPA documents, um, there's a number of responsible entities or lead agencies that try and use uh, one type of consultation in lieu of another. So for example, AB 52 was already done for CEQA, but then they have to go do NEPA and they have to do section 106 consultation. And oftentimes it'll be recommended, we don't need to do section 106, we already did AB 52 and there was no response. Is that, is that appropriate to do from your understanding? By definition of the law, no, that is not sufficient um, because each notification is tailored to that specific um, effort. Um, as I mentioned before, they each have different intents and different purposes. SB 18 is policy versus AB 52 is resource. And section 106 is kind of a hybrid of, of those two. So even the intent and purpose is different. Um, and so the each, each notification requirements are different according to law. Um, however, each consultation effort can be done uh, simultaneously. So if there was a project that required uh, both AB 52 and section 106, uh, both notifications can be sent at the same time and a meeting can address both items but they would need to be fulfilling both requirements individually. Um, and so um, it can be done, but it would need to meet the requirements. Um, but saying that one was done and that covers the other would be insufficient. Okay, well, that is all the questions we have. Thank you, Ethan, for this. And as I mentioned, this is being recorded, will be put on our YouTube site where all the other Ethan's other presentations are located. Um, and you will get a Zoom email tomorrow with that um, link to the site. So I just want to thank everybody for attending and uh, keep in mind our future monthly presentations. And thank you. Thank you.